Good evening, everybody. I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute Science Museum, your cool astronomer, with another edition of Night Skies at Home. Here we are on Thursday, June 11th, uh, almost on our way to the first day of summer. And this is a, another installment of our program that's going to help you connect with the evening skies. You know, Night Skies at Home is our program that uh, takes over for our Night Skies at the Observatory program, which we've run at the Franklin Institute uh, every month since 2006. That's a program in which we bring folks into the Franklin Institute to make use of the resources we have there to help connect people with, this, with the night sky. It's our telescope in the observatory, the telescopes on the fifth floor roof deck, our planetarium programming, all of our hands-on activities and other portions of the program that help everyone connect with the night sky. We're doing that in a version at home because of the pandemic quarantine, we may find ourselves now looking for alternative content and programming. I think there's only so much Netflix we can all watch and we probably binge watched everything there is to binge watch so far. So we now have an opportunity to get closer to the universe. The way I say it is it's your universe, explore it. Now you have plenty of time on your hands to actually do that. This way, you can become an expert in the night sky, if you will, an expert sky watcher with very little effort from one night to the next. In this program, we'll give you all sorts of tips, tricks, facts, and information that you can use to help you become able to recognize easily the constellations, the stars, the planets, the phenomenon that you can see in the evening sky. We hope that you'll use this information so that you can connect again with the sky in a way that helps you feel as if you're part of the universe, directly connected to the universe. In fact, in these days of uncertainty and upheaval, demonstrations and protests, you might find that the evening sky provides a wonderful respite, a calming environment where you can go and stare out into the universe and take a moment to drain away all of these things that might bring us some stress during our days. The evening sky is a wonderful place to sort of think about the universe, think about the future, or think about what has happened in the universe. So think about all sorts of things. Give you a little bit more of a spiritual connection uh, that might help you calm a little bit in these days of turmoil. So this program, Night Skies at, the home, at Home, will hopefully provide you with that information you need. So tonight, as always, we want your questions. So please send your questions to us. We'll throw them into the chat box. They'll come to me. We'll try to answer as many of them as we possibly can. We always want to know what it is you're interested in finding out about astronomy. So please send us your questions. We want you to be part of this program. So let's have those questions. Also this evening, we'll talk just a little bit about the SpaceX Demo-2 mission. Remember two weeks ago, uh, the SpaceX Crew Dragon took off from Kennedy Space Center in Florida carrying two astronauts up to International Space Station. What happened to them, you might be asking yourselves, because I'll bet you haven't heard a thing about them since then. So we'll talk a little bit about that. I'll also show you a wonderful infographic that shows you what part of the entire mission they're in right now and we'll provide a link for you to go and get that infographic so you can study it a lot closer. If you're a, a, a space fact junkie like I am, you'll find this incredibly dense, cluttered, detailed poster almost overwhelming. Yeah, just the way I like it. Maybe you will too, but you can judge for yourself. We'll give you the link so you can go take a look at that. Also tonight, we have a special guest with us, Dr. Michael Joseph Williams. Dr. Michael Joseph Williams is a recently minted PhD from Delaware State University in optics, and he happens to be an alumnus of the uh, PAX program at the Franklin Institute Science Museum. I've known Michael, fortunately, for a number of years, ever since he was in the PAX program, and have been fortunate enough to be able to follow along during his educational career. I've asked Michael to join us this evening so that we can talk a little bit about his experiences as a person of color in STEM education going into a rather challenging field. So in about 10 minutes or so, Mike is gonna join us. We'll talk to him about what that's been like and uh, hopefully that'll provide some insight for you about what the challenges are for being a person of color in academia. So we'll talk about that as we get there. 
Of course, we want your questions, as I said before, but we're also gonna take a look at the night sky and see what's available for you to be seen. So as I've said before now three times, don't forget to send us your questions. All right, let's get started with just the sky phenomena that we have coming to us this evening. You know, I always start out with sunrise and sunset. And to me, that's kind of an interesting thing because of the sky phenomena, it allows us to see when we're just outside walking around during the day. And here's what I mean. Sunrise right now comes at 5.31 a.m. So the sky is already beginning to lighten up at 4.45 a.m. Wow, that's awfully early. Yeah, but it's a part and parcel of the season that we're heading toward. You know, in just 10 days, nine days in fact, we're gonna to come to the summer solstice, what we call the first day of summer. That's the point at which we have the greatest number of hours and minutes of daylight provided by the sun being up above the horizon for that long. We think of it as the longest day of the year. Well, all days are about 24 hours long, but it's the day in which we have, or around that time, we have the longest or greatest amount of sunlight for the day at that portion of the season. Now, sunset comes at 8.29 p.m. tonight. That's where we are right now, right around 8.30. We're still gonna pick up another five minutes of daytime, actually, as we move toward the summer solstice coming up on June 20th. Well, right now, for this week, we are adding time to that at the rate of about 34 seconds a day. So we're still growing in the day. But once we come to that day, the 20th, that's gonna be the end of it. And about a week and a half to two weeks later, I hate to break the news to you, but we're gonna start losing minutes of daylight. You won't really notice it at first because it goes so slowly. But as we get into August and then into September, of course, it picks up and we can definitely see the change first in sunsets coming earlier then followed by sunrises coming later and later. But here's how I want you to take a notice of this during the day as you're walking around. It's a way that you can measure a couple of things, one of which is the motion of the earth around the sun. We'll talk about this more in detail next week as we get closer to the equin, closer to the solstice. But I want you to, over this weekend, look for something in your neighborhood like a utility pole or a fire hydrant or something of that sort. And I want you to note the shadow of that object around noon. Note what its position is relative to other things around it and notice its length, the length of that shadow. As the earth moves around the sun, the earth's orientation toward the sun changes. And this in turn affects the length of the shadow of those vertical objects. So around the 20th, those vertical objects at noon will have their shortest shadows of the entire year. Their shortest shadows of the entire year. But you can watch that shadow grow as we move around toward the winter solstice coming up in December. Now I know this sounds like a lot, but it's a really easy observation. You don't really have to buy any equipment or anything like that to keep track of the Earth's motion as it heads around the sun. So we'll talk about that more in detail next week, but that's what's happening. Okay, the moon is now a waning gibbous of about 20 days old. And that means that it's rising fairly late right now. Today it rose at 12.44 a.m., 12.44 in the morning, and it's set at 11.13 uh, this morning, 11.13, uh, that would have been, yes, 11.13 this morning is when it's set. Now, tomorrow, it's going to rise at 1.14 in the morning and set at 12.13 p.m. What this means is you won't actually be able to see the moon in the, in the sky unless you go out and look for it in the morning when it would be visible high in the western sky. You might have a little bit of a challenge seeing it just because of the contrast meaning the difference between the brightness of the object and the brightness of the background sky. If you have a much higher contrast, the sky being dark while the moon is bright, it makes it easy to see the moon. But when the brightness of the object and the moon are very close to each other, that means the contrast is very low. So it might be difficult for you to see it, but this will reinforce the idea that you can see the moon in the sky almost every day of its lunar cycle of 29 and a half days. So you'll be able to catch it tomorrow morning between say 8 a.m. and noon, if you go out and look high in the western sky, you'll be able to find the moon. Look for it, you'll be amazed to see what it looks like. Now, how about planets? 
Well, the planets are actually making a shift right now. Planets are shifting from being visible primarily in the pre-dawn sky to being visible in the evening sky now. So now we talked for a long time about how Venus was visible in the evening sky. That's now gone. Two weeks ago, when we were here last, we talked about Mercury. Mercury is a tiny dot. It's slowly heading down toward the uh, western horizon and will no longer be visible in another week and a half or so. But don't despair. Why? Because as it turns out, those planets that we were viewing in the pre-dawn sky weeks ago that we could only see in the pre-dawn sky, they've now snuck around into the evening sky. Now, albeit it's very late. And here's what I mean. Jupiter and Saturn, the two showcase planets of our solar system, the biggest planets of our solar system, now are rising and are visible in the evening sky in the southeast, just above the horizon, at 11.30 p.m. So if you're a night owl and you're up late, you'll be able to see them as they make their way up from the southeastern horizon around midnight. And you can now watch them all through the rest of the night into the early morning hours. And if you're really an insomniac, you can see them as they fade away as the sky becomes bright with the coming of the sun. So that means that in the next month, they're going to continue to rise earlier and earlier in the evening. So this is setting us up for a perfect opportunity this summer to keep a close eye on the two largest planets, the two most photogenic planets of our solar system, Jupiter and Saturn. Everybody loves them. They're great showpieces. They look fine in binoculars. Telescopes, they look even better. We'll get to that later also. So look for that. Okay, so now Mars actually is rising at 2 a.m., rising at 2 a.m. And tomorrow morning, you'll find the moon rising with Mars at 2 a.m. And of course, that's gonna happen with Mars too. It'll back its way into the evening sky. It'll take a while for that to happen. So that's what you can see of planets. I encourage you, if you're staying up late, check those guys out. Okay, what's up next? Our constellation suite this week that we'll talk about a little bit later includes Leo the Lion, constellation we talked about two weeks ago. Ursa Major, where we find the Big Dipper, a constellation on a, an asterism almost everyone knows. We'll talk about the bright star Arcturus in the constellation Bootes the Herdsman. We'll also talk about Virgo the Virgin. We'll talk about Sagittarius the Great Archer. And we'll connect all this to the Milky Way. Everybody wants to see the Milky Way. Well, it's not too difficult if you're someplace where the skies are clear and dark, and you can manage to get yourself there without too much trouble this summer you can have a really spectacular view, and you can also manage your social distancing at the same time, no problem with that at all, and you'll have a rewarding view of that. Uh, it's rising over on the eastern side of the sky at about the time the sky gets dark, and if we wait a little bit later, as I said, around 11.30 or midnight, you'll see that it has arced up higher in the sky. We'll have some photos of that. We'll talk a little bit about the structure and orientation of, the, of our galaxy, the Milky Way, in relation to us as we're viewing it in the sky. You know, we always talk about International Space Station and its visibility. Well, hate to tell you this, but it's not available in, uh, for visibility right now. We have about a week and a half, two week period in which we won't be able to see it in the evening sky. It's gonna make it switch around to the morning sky, but that'll be just in time for the summer as it warms up and we'll be able to catch it in the pre-dawn sky. Uh, so we'll do that. This, this week's constellation, by the way, is Virgo. Virgo is this week's constellation. And if you'll recall from the last time we were together, we looked at this group of constellations we call the zodiac band. This is the path across the sky where the sun, moon, and planets seem to travel. And the path itself is known as the ecliptic. We'll talk about that a little bit later. But that's the constellation. Virgo is right in that band of the zodiac group. If you know what your zodiac birth sign is, why don't you send that to us in the chat and let us know. Is it Virgo by any chance? Well, let us know. It'd be interesting to find out. We'll talk a little bit about that. But Virgo is a really cool constellation because it has a whole swarm of galaxies located among its stars. It also has some really interesting stars. We'll talk a little bit about those facts as well. So we'll get all that sort of stuff done. Okay. So, uh, I also have some wonderful images that we'll take a look at a little bit later as well. And so uh, you'll join us, you'll stay with us for that. So don't forget, we're looking for your questions. Please send us your questions. Let me check real quickly and see if we have any questions so far. Indeed. 
Red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky in morning, sailor take warning. What is the explanation for this question? Ah, yes, it is red sky at night, sailors delight. Red sky at morning, sailors take warning. Well, this saying that has been around for such a long time and used by mariners to figure out what sky conditions are going to, or weather conditions are going to be like in the near future is a way for them to recognize different kinds of weather patterns, different kinds of frontal systems. And what they're talking about is seeing a frontal system either approaching or having already passed. So in this particular instance, what they're suggesting is if you have a red sky at night, meaning that the clouds in the sky are illuminated by the sun over on the western horizon as it's setting, then that suggests to them that weather is clearing out. Red sky at night, sailors delight. It's all about the light reflecting off of the clouds, sunlight reflecting off of the clouds. Red sky at morning, sailor take morning, meaning that these clouds are approaching. And because those clouds are approaching, perhaps they're gonna bring inclement weather. Now, these days we tend to rely on scientific equipment that gives us information and data about air pressures, wind directions, temperatures, and other factors that help us to be much more exact about what weather conditions are coming our way. And so while this is really a wonderful sort of saying that we now uh, look back on in history as something that might have been very useful for mariners some time ago, we now have much more accurate ways of telling exactly what's going to happen. So that's the nature of what that is. Do we have another question? We do indeed. Do you offer any intro courses in astrophotography? That's a really great, the question is, do I offer, do we offer any intro courses in astrophotography? Well, that's a really interesting field to tackle. And actually, no, I don't. But you know what? That's a really great idea. I didn't think about it, but I, can, I have a friend that I can invite on as a guest that we might be able to use. We can pick that person's mind and see what we can learn about basic astrophotography that we might be able to do with our smartphones, with our binoculars, with a telescope that we might have at home. Yeah, that's a really great suggestion. Thank you very much. I'll get on that. We'll plan that for a program upcoming. What's next? Well, this person likes to know, says, I'm a Virgo and have no idea what the constellation looks like or where it is. Ha 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 ha. The question is, a person says, I'm a Virgo, but I have no idea what the constellation looks like or where it is. Well, if you stay with us, Right after we chat with Dr. Williams, we're going to jump out into the night sky and take a look to see what those constellations look like and where they are so that you can go out and view it tonight. So stay with us. We'll come back to you. Okay, we'll take more of your questions later. But right now, I'd like to do something very special. I would like to invite, uh, hold on, let me show, make sure I can get this right. There we go. I'd like to welcome Dr. Michael Joseph Williams to our program this evening. As I mentioned before, Dr. Michael Joseph Williams is uh, an alumni of the PAX program at the Franklin Institute Science Museum, a high school youth science program that he was part of for a number of years. And we'll ask him to tell us a little bit about that. But the reason why I've asked him to join us tonight is because he's a recent, recently minted doctor of physics. His specialty is optics. He graduated from uh, Delaware State U University after attending both Morehouse College and Fisk University. He's actually from the nice town section of Philadelphia. And I have to ask you more about that, Dr. Williams, because guess what? I'm from nice town too. So we're nice town homies, all right? So hold on, we'll come to that. Uh, so during his PAX program stint, uh, one of his PAX highlights in 2004 was when the PAX summer program won best scientific presentation in that year's citywide summer program presentation contest. The hands-on experience at PAX influenced him tremendously to pursue a career in physics and material science, which ultimately led him to study optics, which of course is the science of light. His PhD research was the investigation of the linear, nonlinear, and fluorescent characterization of various nanodiamond suspensions using well-established characterization methods and techniques. We're gonna to have to ask you to explain to us what that means, Dr. Williams, but it sounds very impressive. But particularly, we're interested in having uh, Dr. Williams help us understand what his journey was like through higher education in pursuit of a PhD. 
I think it's pretty well known. Uh, perhaps it isn't pretty well known, but we should clearly understand that there are biases, institutional and systemic biases in higher education in many places that make it more challenging for people of color and for women to be high achievers. And so Dr. Williams comes to us from a very interesting place in that he's so much younger than I am. He's much closer to what things are like right now. And I know this probably affects him in a different way. So we'd like to talk to him a little bit about that. Dr. Williams, thank you very much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you tonight. Glad to be here, sir. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. So first of all, let's get to this piece, which I think is really exciting and interesting. You're from Nicetown. Tell us where in Nicetown. So where? Where in Nicetown? Yeah. Um, so I lived on Grant Street, which is around the corner from Summit Grant's High School. Oh, I see. So now let me see. If I'm remembering correctly, Simon Gratz High School, folks, this is in uh, North Central Philadelphia. It's called the Nice Town Section. Simon Gratz High School is right on Honey Park Avenue, not far from Germantown Avenue. So where Germantown and Honey Park Avenue intersect, Gratz is just a couple of blocks to the west of that. And it's, it's right next door to Gillespie Junior High School. Did you go to Gillespie Junior High School by any chance, Michael? Actually, uh... The rest we know, the, um, the, there's an elementary school down the street, all right, on Gratz. Um, I forgot the name, but my mother had gone to that school, uh, you know, on, on Gratz Street, so, yeah. <laughs> I see. Okay, well, the, here's the reason why I ask. I ask that question because I grew up about four blocks south of mm -hmm. Gratz High School. Okay. So, yeah, so you grew up on Grant Street, not far away from that. So we grew up in the same neighborhood, just a few blocks away from each other. So we know all those streets well, Pacific Street and Venango Street and Erie Avenue and Broad and Germantown, right? Yes, sir. But here's a um, his, um, uh, kind of trivia for where I lived at. So um, on Grant Street, I had... Um, lived somewhere previously. I lived in Mount Airy um, during elementary school. Oh, and okay. I went to uh, F.S. Edmonds uh, in Mount Airy. And then when I graduated from uh, Edmonds from elementary school, then we moved to Grass Street in Nice Town. So, but, uh, so the, the reason I say Nice Town, and that's where I lived the majority of my life. So that's why, you know, I have to claim it. <laughs> wow, that's, that sounds great. You know, if you're from Nice Town and I'm from Nice Town, I think that's saying really good things about Nice Town, don't you? Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, Dr. Williams, if you will, please, tell us about your terminal degree. It's a PhD in physics, specialty in optics, and tell us a little bit about your, uh, about the work that you did for your dissertation. Okay. So um, actually the PhD is in optics. So the reason I say physics is because um, that's what people normally uh, gravitate, gravitate towards we go to understand um, people's uh, majors. But um, optics, um, like I said, is the science of light um, and just looking at how light can interact with matter, how we can manipulate light, how we can use light for any type of um, purposes, any type of application. And uh, my dissertation, my thesis was all about uh, the investigation of how to properly engineer nano diamonds. And, you know, a lot of people don't understand that how you can have a nano diamond, you know, usually diamonds are on someone's ring. So it's sure, finger. and that's like carrots of diamonds. So that's ever larger and larger diamonds yeah. on the ring, right? But you're talking about nano, it's tremendously small, right? It's so small. So you're thinking about um, the regular um, diamond uh, on a ring, right? So a nano diamond is a billionth smaller than that. So you, wow. it blows the mind of how small it actually is. So, um, but the reason why I was investigating nano diamonds is because of its superior optical properties that normally you would not see in um, in regular um, 
material. Uh, nano diamonds are actually carbon. They're made out of carbon, carbon atoms. And carbon is uh, considered an organic uh, uh, atom, meaning that uh, if we're able to uh, use carbon in any type of biological structure, like the human body, uh, it, it, it would not harm the human body at all. So, so we were able to look at that and see how we can uh, utilize diamond for any type of um, bio, you know, bi biological application. For example, I have studied uh, where people have used nano diamonds to act as a cellular biomarker for early cancer detection. Right. Okay. Normally, you would not think about that, but. It is so phenomenal how people can use uh, nano diamond for any type of um, application for modern medicine. Or even uh, we can use uh, diamond, if you will, to create uh, brand new wavelengths that conventional lasers cannot attain. So, so, uh, so picture this. So you have a large diamond crystal okay, in the shape of a wafer, and you put it in front of a laser that is green light. And particularly uh, when we're talking about lasers, uh, they operate in wavelengths. And so for green lights, you are particularly in a wavelength of 500 nanometers. And typically we look at wavelengths in the form of, of uh, nanometers. So. If we were to uh, uh, shine or even uh, direct a laser to a diamond wafer, and this diamond wafer has what is known, uh, what is called a defect, a color defect, meaning that um, in the, or we, we call it a crystal matrix or a crystal lattice, um, think of it as, uh, we, uh, you know, what, a, what the, a, a, a buckyball is in, in the chemistry, right? Um, so uh, you have all um, all atoms uh, connected uh, in some sort of a ball. Right. So, okay. So the thing about it is that in a crystal lattice, you, you are connected with all carbon atoms. However, if you are able to let's say you pluck out a carbon atom to make a vacant spot. Mm -hmm. Right next to it, you replace a carbon atom with a nit with a uh, nitrogen atom. Uh -huh. Combination of, of the nitrogen atom and the vacancy, that is what is called a nitrogen vacancy defect. And that defect will allow you to create a whole new slew of wavelengths once you, uh, once you shine a laser on it. For example, if you shine green onto the crystal, you will get yellow. Uh -huh. Okay. Yeah, and there's so many color defects that you can use to create brand new wavelengths, and we can honestly harness the new wavelengths that are being generated into um, having, um, you know, other lasers that normally we cannot make um, using um, conventional methods. So, and so I could, so then you could, you could, you could, uh, you could, you could create different applications. For yes. which those different lasers could be used, and these would all be new creations of new applications for this that had not been possible before. So rather than just having one kind of laser or two kinds of lasers, you might be able to have 20 or 30 or 40 different kinds of lasers that have different qualities and properties to do different, different things. Yeah, yeah. So wow. Exactly. That that's the kind of reaction that I got uh, when I started studying diamond. It is so phenomenal. So um, just to go to what actually my work was, it was just to look at the different characteristics, how um, the nano diamonds would react uh, regarding um, different what's called characterization methods or characterization techniques. So. It was just an overall study on, on what we can do regarding different situations, how we can possibly engineer diamond to act like a, um, a sensor for temperature, 
for uh, for um, working different uh, retro fields mm -hmm. or fields, if you will, um, and even fluorescence. Um, there are many different things that you can use diamond for, and so it was just an overall study that I did just to look at what we can do with that. Exciting. Okay. So now, so what we so what I'd like to ask you about is I'd like to ask you about what your experience it was like being a student of color in mm -hmm. physics as you made your way along. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, a, it, it's interesting that you chose that to begin with, but I think it's even more interesting uh, to talk a little bit about what your experience was like as a student in physics. Tell us, tell us about, about uh, oh, some of the challenges that you saw. So um, just to be clear, my uh, journey is not your typical journey because I went to three historically black, black colleges and universities. Uh, Morehouse College um, is in Atlanta, Georgia, um, uh, which is uh, famous for uh, being the college that Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. graduated from in, in 1948. Yeah. Uh, and so that you know, my journey was start there. And it was interesting to just be around um, other African American men who wanted to be great in their field as well. Um, and the type of challenges um, weren't necessarily with uh, the students by themselves or even the content work. It was just relating at that time to the different professors who would be there to teach us. Um, so at uh, Morehouse, we had several professors who were uh, African, uh, African professors who came directly from uh, Africa to teach over here in America. And what was really disheartening at the time was their attitude towards us being African American students. Because in their mind, they had either had come across a lot of different students that were lazy, that weren't as serious about their work, and that caused them to believe a narrative about us and think that all of us were the same. All of us were trying to get ahead and do less work. And it was really, really, um, it was, it, was, it, was, it was kind of uh, disappointing to um, work with some professors that had the attitude towards us at an historically black college. So, um, but, okay. um, but uh, when I graduated from Morehouse, I went to a program called the Fisk Vanderbilt Masters to PhD Bridge Program. Um, that program is specifically designed to help um, minority students bridge the gap into um, going towards the PhD. And so that particular uh, uh, era in my life was really phenomenal. Even though it was only two years, uh, the professors there uh, were very helpful. They were very supportive. Um, they, were, they were very open to help people bridge the gaps in the understanding in their concepts. And so that was a fantastic time in my life. So the problems if you will, um, regarding um, being a physics student, didn't really arrive or occur until I went into my doctoral uh, studies at okay. Denver University. Okay. So uh, during that time, I had joined an international optics society called SPIE. Mm -hmm. It stands for the Society of Photo, of Photo Instrumentational Engineers. Mm -hmm. Um, being part of this organization, I was uh, invited to um, go into a student leadership uh, conference. Um, and I met students from all over the world who also have studied optics and photonics as well. What I saw was that I was the only Black American there at this particular conference. Okay. It was kind of if you will, because I was hoping that we had most of, of a representation of not just Black Americans, but um, Black people from all, all over the world, since this is an international society. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm not um, going to bash it at all because it was a phenomenal, I'm, I'm still part of SBIE, sure. but, um, but I always wondered why is it that when I would visit uh, the conferences, there weren't many um, African-American representation there. And it, it was it was weird because I didn't want to look at it as if they invited me or allowed me to be part of uh, this organization as a sense of tokenism versus of gradualism, right. saying they are diverse. And, and to be honest, they are diverse. They have people from all over the world, from Mexico, from uh, Japan, from, uh, from, some from Nigeria. But the thing is, it wasn't enough. And I didn't want to be the only black person that was present at these conferences. Well, let me ask you two questions about that. When you were a high school student, first considering the possibility of going into physics, yes. were there other friends or colleagues that you knew at that time who might also have been considering careers in physics? Not at the time, no. I was pretty much uh, um, uh, a very uh, strong-willed uh, young man. Um, but the reason why I wanted to go into physics in the first place, um, and this ties into my experience with the PAX program, um, the, the PAX program exposed me to not just the idea of being a scientist, but uh, but actually it, that's where my love for space science started. Um, I just love going to the Institute and going to the Space Command and just learning all about space. I really loved it as a child. And that um, the program that you described in 2004 when we did the presentation, um, I had did it um, uh, on the bio of Guyan Bluford, uh, the first African-American astronaut in space. Yeah, that's and, right. And honestly, when I, st I had studied Guyan Bluford's life during elementary school, and I was so enamored by his life by the fact that one, he's from Philadelphia. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he has struggles of his own because he went to Overbrook, Overbrook in West Philadelphia, and his high school uh, counselor at the time thought that he was not fit for a career in the hard sciences because he was a B student. Uh huh. Okay. It's, right. And so it is in this um is in the biography that I had um, read as a child, and just to see that this person, this black person from Philadelphia, he had people say no to him, but he believed in himself and he believed in his potential, even though it didn't it didn't matter if he had only B grades, he knew he can make um uh, he can go the distance, if you will. So that really uh, uh, settled with me in regarding what I like to do in my life. And I always love space science. I still do. And so, you know, the question could be, why didn't I go the route of studying astronomy? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. <laughs> I'm so sorry, Derek. That's okay. That's okay. I'll forgive you for that. That's fine. Um, Optics is great. <laughs> the thing about it is that I love space science, but I think because I was so acclimated to be at the Franklin Institute because it's a hands-on science museum, that um, was imprinted in me to want to do things hands-on. Sure. It's not that you can't do astronomy hands-on, you definitely can, but I like to create things with my hands. I like to um, develop uh, new technologies and I felt that at that time, uh, because astronomy requires a lot of coding, a lot of anal analyzing data, and at the time, that wasn't one that that wasn't something that I wanted to do. So you're saying that you were you were interested. You're actually much more interested in building instrumentation and building devices and equipment. Yes. That's yes. great. That's great. Now let me ask you this about uh, what you've seen 
as uh, as part of SPY, now that you're out in the field, do and, and you said that you expected or you would you would be encouraged by seeing more people of color. How do you think this is? How do you think this is developing in the field? In, you know, in your discipline in optics or of what you may know about the field of physics. Uh, do you see that there are more opportunities now for people of color in physics? Does it seem to you that more people of color are moving toward physics as a possible career path? And I'll have one more question for you after that. Um, to be honest, I want to say yes, but from what I observed currently, there's still a lot of people who are afraid to make that jump. Maybe because either they didn't have enough people rooting for them, because you need to have a support system. Um, and a lot of people don't have that because a lot of people had believed the lie that quote unquote black people can't do mathematics or physics. Right, that we don't do science. Right. And that is a total lie in society. Of but fortunately that so many people believe that lie. Um, and I grew up liking math. I was so good in doing algebra and pre-calculus and going all the way into the advanced uh, mathematics. I, I love, you know, working with numbers. And so I think there's, and there's also a, there's a sense of wanting to belong somewhere. And because a lot of the faces that they see are not black nor brown, they feel that that's not part of their world. And actually, they didn't want to be stigmatized as a token trying to branch over. Wow. Even, even though, in my personal opinion, the reason why I continue to do physics is so that I can be an example for others who are coming behind me. Because I want to have more people in physics uh, and loving uh, physics, but I just feel that if I'm able to be at a position where I went the distance, earned the PhD, and I will be at a, um, I will have a platform so young black boys and black girls who came from the same neighborhoods as you and I, they will have more of a confidence in themselves. They say that, yes, I can do the same thing too. Unfortunately, we don't have enough people doing that, especially you know, with black men. You know what, that's, uh, it's so interesting that, you, that you've encapsulated that particular concept because it, it sounds that, you know, it sounds that as a student in physics, in optics, you have much more of, uh, you have much more work that you're doing than the other students are because not only are you carrying the load of doing the physics itself, but you're mm -hmm. also carrying the load of being in an environment that feels uncomfortable, that may not feel friendly, that may not feel welcoming. And right. so part of what you have to do with your, and correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like part of what you have to do with the, you know, with the mental sort of, um, uh, not capability, but, but what you have available to, to work with as you're working in the physics is you also have to deal with all this other social stuff at the same time. Yes. And so you have to arrange that and work with that and make that work and then make that integrate with the work that you're doing in physics right. just to do that work. So it's like you're doing two or three jobs at once rather than just the one of being a student. Right. And I've had people um, who I've worked with um, at um, some of the universities I've been in say, oh, uh, I don't see color or I'm colorblind. And these, these were professors who worked at these uh, universities. Um, they weren't black and they were trying to, you know, say to me that um, it doesn't matter uh, what color you are because science is science and, you know, data is data. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Saying that science is colorblind. 
the problem with that because you are now saying that the person who is doing the science the problems that arise but based on his appearance to other people that doesn't matter and to say that um it is it's, it's, it's to say that you are oblivious or you are blind to the problems of mental health regarding people of color that want to succeed, but they have so many people saying that you're making excuses or I don't, that the things that you're saying do not happen. All of a sudden, it messes with your um, mental health. And then you have, a, unfortunately, you have a lot of black students who have the potential and they have the drive, but they don't have the support system nor people that believe or even have any empathy regarding the social issues that arise from being black in America. You have a lot of people dropping out because they can't handle the pressure. They so can't, this. yeah, they can't handle all of the unnecessary drama that they want to avoid because they want to succeed. And it's not about not working hard. They have to work twice as hard in order to get respected. Because of all these other kinds of issues that have to be handled and juggled at the same time. Right. And that's and that can be that can be really so sort of disabling in a sense. So now let me let me ask you this, Mike. Uh, let me ask you this last question. Yes. What would you say to what would you say to uh, young people of color today that want to pursue careers in physics? Worth it or not? Oh yeah, it is definitely worth it. It is definitely worth it because that is, like I said, that's the mentality I have. I want to encourage as many black students to go all the way because. <laughs> because the world needs it. Yeah. The world needs to see um, that, <laughs> my, you know, my personal hope, in the, for over 100 years, there hasn't been a black Nobel laureate for any science. Mm -hmm. And I want that to change. In order for that to change, we got to have people in the sciences, no matter if it's physics, no it was um, biology or chemistry or biochemistry or even robotics. I want the whole landscape of the, you know, I'll say the system, if you will, regarding academia to fully change and be more reflective on the demographics of society because it's not all white it is not all asian it is a multicolored conglomerate of people who are able to do many magnificent things we just need the opportunity we just need the right support system and we just need to have the right mentorship you know for us to be on the right path that we need to be on so the end game is so worth it. And because from my personal experience, I have been through a lot. <laughs> I've been through a lot um, proving myself, proving my intelligence towards becoming the doctorate. Yeah. And I feel that even though some people may think that, um, that the investment of all those years may not be worth it, in the in the in the long run, it is. It doesn't matter if you can um, just go and get a master's degree and then uh, go into getting a tech job uh, with six figures, which you can do. But for me, I'm looking at the people that are going to come behind me because I want to make a change, and I feel that having the PhD will open so many doors for me and will allow people in the in the higher echelon of society and knowledge to listen to what I have to say. 
And that's it. I put, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry. No, 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 that's okay. That is an admirable goal because that is so badly needed in academia and in industry and in the world in general. And so, you know, my hat is off to you, brother, for doing exactly that, by being willing to do exactly that. I want to thank you so much for being with us tonight, Michael. You've helped us understand uh, one of the darker corners of uh, what it's like to be in higher academia uh, as a person of color. And, um, you know, I know where you are. You, you say you're from nice town, so I know where I can find you. And uh, I'd, like to, I'd like to thank you for being with us tonight. I'll invite you to come back and join us again at some point in the future. But thanks yeah. for sharing your experience with us. Uh, we greatly appreciate it. Oh, thank you for having me. And I'm sorry the light is not, uh, you know, optimal right now. Uh, the sun is setting right now. So. It's okay. <laughs> no, no worries. Light is your business, so I'm sure you'll figure it out. Yes, definitely. definitely. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. I like that I see it, this audience right here. It's pretty, pretty cool. Yeah, okay, great. Okay. So, folks, I've been speaking with Dr. Uh, with Dr. Michael Williams, uh, who has recently received his uh, PhD as a graduate from Delaware State University in optics. He is an alumni of the Franklin Institute's PACS program, a youth science program that has been uh, really a wonderful program at the Franklin Institute for many years. And it's great to see Michael uh, back in the Philadelphia area and great to have you here on our program uh, tonight. Thanks again, Michael. We'll talk to you again soon. Dr. Michael Williams. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Take care. We'll talk to you again soon. Okay, folks, that was really helpful to have uh, Dr. Will Williams with us to help us understand a little bit more about what his journey has been like uh, as a person of color pursuing science, uh, very, very high level science. And uh, now what I'd like to do is uh, jump back into some of the content that we were going to talk about a little bit earlier. I think the last question we had before we went to talk to Dr. Williams was a question about uh, the constellation Virgo itself. Uh, someone that brought, sent us a question was asking about being able to see Virgo. And uh, now it's time for us to jump off and take a look at where Virgo is in the sky. So I'm going to grab my laptop, bring everything over here so that we can continue. And uh, we're going to go right out into one of our sky programs that will give us an opportunity to uh, see where Virgo is in the sky. I'm just going to shift some things around here. And uh, what's going to happen next is I'm going to share my screen. So let's jump off onto the screen sharing and we'll go from there and see where we're headed. Okay, so first of all, let's see, where am I going? Oh yes, here we are. I'm gonna come over right over here to my program called Stellarium. I'm gonna minimize myself here. And uh, here we are folks, let's find out what time it is first of all. This is the Stellarium desktop program that I talk about using so often. And I'm gonna bring up my date and time window. Hopefully you can see my arrow now. Uh, we're working here on June 11th. And the time that's being shown here is uh, 11 p.m. And that's uh, 11.30 at night. And what I'm gonna do, folks, is I'm gonna back this up uh, just an hour or so, so that we can begin just as the sky is darkening after sunset. And so I've now rotated the sky around so that we can see the direction west and see where the sun is setting over here on the western side of the sky, a little bit north of west, in fact. And I've also added a little bit of complication to the sky for tonight. First of all, you can see the bright stars. The sky isn't dark enough yet. We're gonna let this run ahead a little bit and let it continue to darken and bring out uh, the stars and constellations of the evening sky. But I've added a couple of features. And one of the features I've added is the red line that you see here. This red line is uh, the path of the sun, moon, and planets across the sky. I used the word earlier. This is what's called the ecliptic. And the ecliptic happens to be, as I said, that path up through the sky where we find the sun, moon, and planets. Now, I have to warn you, this is a feature that you'll see in this particular program. Uh, if you go outside and you see this red line across the sky, you really need to go back in and lay down, maybe get a cool drink of water because it really shouldn't be out there. Of course, it's part of the graphics package here that allows us to see where that path is. And so now you've noticed that the sky has gotten much darker in the Northwest. I'm gonna bring us around towards South. And as I'm doing that, I want you to notice that over on the left side of the screen in the Southeast, you're beginning to see all of this sort of bright cloudy material that stretches up along the sky here. 
And what you're seeing there actually is our Milky Way. Now I stopped time at about 20 minutes after 11 this evening. And I did that because I wanted you to be able to see Milky Way appears in our evening sky. But let's go back and do those connections of those constellations that I mentioned as the constellation suite that would get us to the Milky Way to begin with. So I'm gonna bring up some information here that will help us. Let's start with constellation lines. And so now what I've done is I've added some line figures that connect the star pattern so that you can begin to identify where things are. You'll notice that the ecliptic line goes right through this group of constellations. And that group of constellations represents that zodiac band. Two weeks ago, we talked about Leo the lion. Here's Leo right here, just above that line. And if we move just behind Leo a little bit in this direction, we come to where we find Virgo. Now, Virgo was supposed to appear to be a woman lying on her side. And if you look at the stick figure, perhaps it doesn't look like that so much, but we can use some clever artwork that will help to fill that in. We've got the words of the constellation here, and now we have the actual figures themselves. So as you can see, here's Leo the lion here. So if you were wondering where you can find Virgo, here are two ways you can do it. First of all, if you recall where Leo is, you'll notice that we're working here at 1120 in the evening and Leo was way over on the Western side of the sky. Just behind Leo is where you'll find the constellation Virgo. Now, a trick that helps you locate it is one that I think can work very well for many people. I've shifted our view up into the sky so that we can see this main constellation that people know so well of Ursa Major, the Big Bear. As part of that constellation is this asterism called the Big Dipper. Everybody knows the Big Dipper. Seven bright stars make up the bowl and the handle, the four right here plus these three. So if you find the Big Dipper and you curve the handle of the Big Dipper and follow that curved line, it brings you down to a bright orange star called Arcturus. And Arcturus, as this bright orange star, is part of a constellation called Buotes. As you continue that curve of the arc down from Buotes, you'll come to the next bright star down. And that next bright star down is this star right here called Spica. So Spica is the brightest star in Virgo. So if you start up here with the curve of the handle, you can come down to bright orange Arcturus in Buotes and continue on down to Virgo. There's a saying that goes with this, like we said earlier, red sky at night, sailors delight. Well, there's another saying and it goes like this. You take the handle of the Big Dipper and you arc to Arcturus and speed on to Spica. So now you've been able to find it that way. So there are two ways that you can find it. You can go from Leo, behind Leo to Virgo, or you can go from the Big Dipper around through Arcturus and then down to Virgo that way. So the cool thing about this whole set of constellations that are part of the Zodiac group is that if you keep moving along to the east past Virgo, Libra is the next constellation that you'll find, followed by Scorpius the Scorpion. Now, the cool thing about the Scorpion is, as it turns out, the Scorpion marks the bottom end of the Milky Way galaxy, of the arms of the Milky Way that we can see. Now, to make things a little bit easier to see here, I'm going to take out the artwork and I'm gonna take out the constellation shapes uh, or the names and I'll just leave the shapes. And now you can see this band of light stretched across the sky that we call the Milky Way. There it is right there. So if you go out in the evening, you can now at 11 p.m., 11.30 p.m., look over toward the southeastern portion of the sky where you'll find this band of light arcing up across the sky. I've now moved us away from the sky a little bit so that you can look up along this line. You'll see there's another line right in here. And that line that you see is the equator of our galaxy. Well, if we think of it as a sphere that completely surrounds us, that middle portion of the sphere marking the equator of the sphere, this is the sphere of our galaxy that we can see here. And so you can easily see this in the evening sky if you go outside. But our galaxy, the Milky Way, Let's find out what our galaxy looks like. I'd like to show you an image of what our Milky Way galaxy looks like. I'm gonna share my screen again, and I'll come right down here to one that we can see 
that looks pretty nice. Let me see if I can just uh, pull up that image really quickly so you can see it. And I'm going to say it's this one right here. Wow. Take a look at that. There's a really cool image of what the Milky Way looks like at a dark sky location. This person is standing in a location, what's called a salt flat. So this is a very, very broad plain with a very, very thin layer of water. And this image taken at night allows us to see the Milky Way stretched across the sky. And it's this band of light that you see here. What we're really doing is we're looking into the arms of our galaxy. So this is where the greatest constellation of stars would be. And this is what we see when we look at the Milky Way in our evening sky. Now from this particular location on the planet, it's, this is showing what that Milky Way looks like in that orientation for this observer. You can actually see here, here's a next door neighbor galaxy right here. That's the large Magellanic cloud there. It's about 170,000 light years away from us. And it's an irregularly shaped galaxy, whereas our galaxy happens to be a spiral shaped galaxy. So when we're out looking at the evening sky, that's what we're seeing when we look for the Milky Way itself. So now, as I mentioned before, that was one of the things that we wanted to take a look at. And when we were answering that question about Virgo, we could see exactly where that is. Now, um, that bright star that I mentioned, Spica, it's the brightest star of Virgo. So it'd be very, very easy to recognize. And of course, you can find out all kinds of information about that star if you go online and just look it up. So let's take a look at some of the other things that we said we were going to look at tonight, just so we can complete everything here. I have a set of images that I will be zipping through just to show you what they look like. You'll recall earlier I mentioned that Jupiter is going to be available for us to see in the evening sky after midnight. It's in this group of pictures that I have here. Uh, there's Saturn right there. We'll bring up Saturn in just a moment. Let's just get rid of this one and go right out here to Jupiter. And as we look at Jupiter here, we can see what a stunning planet it is. And this is the reason why people are so excited or why anyone would be so excited to look at Jupiter in the evening sky is because of the detail that we can see in the upper cloud deck of the planet, along with, of course, the iconic Great Red Spot. The Great Red Spot is visible in a small telescope. And these stripes and bands that you can see on the surface of the planet are also visible in a small telescope. And even a pair of binoculars will show this if you have a nice tripod that you can mount those onto so that you can have a steady view of the planet. Uh, so if you have a good telescope, you can see a lot of this detail really, really nicely in the evening sky. This is a gas giant planet. It's big enough to house hundreds of planets the size of Earth inside it. So that's always a great object to see in the evening sky. As I mentioned also, Saturn is out there and looks great. Here's a wonderful view of Saturn taken by a space telescope, Hubble Space Telescope, that shows really nicely, uh, just a moment, here we are, sharing this pause, bring your uh, window to the front. Uh, I think we have this, uh, can we see this on the screen just fine? A yes. beautiful image of Saturn, thank you yes. very much. And so we can see the rings of Saturn here looking really wonderful. When Galileo first saw this in a telescope back in 1610, he thought the planet had ears. He thought these curved regions were ears on the planet. His telescope wasn't really good enough to show him the rings, uh, so he thought that's what he was seeing. Imagine what Galileo must have felt like being the first person ever, ever in history to see this up close. So there's Jupiter and Saturn, objects that are easily seen. Let me not forget that particular graphic that I mentioned earlier that I wanted you to see. This comes from us from an, uh, this comes from us, comes to us from an illustrator by the name of Tony Bella. And Tony Bella has created this really, really great detailed in, uh, illustration of NASA's Demo 2 mission. Now, I said it was complicated. We'll provide a link so you can go out and look at the details. But where are we in the mission right now? Well, here are the first portions of the mission over on the left-hand side of the screen, as you can see. The launch of the spacecraft, the return of the booster coming back to land on the barge out in the Atlantic Ocean. And the capsule then went on to dock with International Space Station. And this is the portion of the mission where the astronauts are right now at point number five, where they are part of the uh, uh, ex expedition crew number 63, where they're participating in all of the same experiments that, are, that have been going on on the International Space Station. They're like extra hands that the three astronauts who are already there have to help 
with all of the other chores and duties and experiments that have to be done. In fact, there are a number of opportunities for those two astronauts uh, to make spacewalks to actually add new equipment onto the exterior of space station. And NASA is figuring out right now when, if and when they want those astronauts to do those spacewalks. How long are they gonna be there? A minimum of six, six weeks and they may be there longer. But after they're done with their mission there, they will bring the Crew Dragon space capsule back through re-entry to uh, experiment with how well it re-enters the Earth's atmosphere and splashes down in the ocean where it'll be recovered. So this particular graphic that you see contains a tremendous amount of information. It is available to the public if you'd like to take a look at it. And as I said, we'll provide a link for this so that you can go out and find this particular graphic yourself and enjoy it. So you'll be able to take a look at that. So let's see, uh, I think what we have uh, coming up left well, for our program this evening is uh, just to remind you all that, you know, the universe is there for you to discover and you can go out and take a look at it and you can learn all about the night sky and then share the experience with your family and friends. Even viewing things like International Space Station is something that can be done at a distance that everyone can enjoy. And I highly recommend that you learn how to find these satellites in the evening sky because it's so exciting to see astronauts as they fly by over your area. Of course, the constellations, the stars and the planets, they're also great to look at as well. And you know, it doesn't take really very much time to familiarize yourself with everything. It only takes a few minutes every evening. Once you get started, figuring out where the constellations are using the Stellarium program or a printable star map of which we'll provide a link for that as well, you can begin to learn the constellations night by night, one at a time. And in about two weeks, two weeks time, say 14 days spread over a month, you'll be familiar with all of the constellations that are available to be seen wherever it is you live. And you can do this right in your own backyard. So even if you don't have a telescope, there's plenty for you to see, and I really encourage you to do so. So we've had a great time talking with Dr. Michael Williams. We've learned a little bit more about the sky. Uh, we've taken a tour around the sky through our Stellarium program. We learned a little bit about the constellation Virgo and the constellations of the Zodiac group. We also learned how to connect constellations of Ursa Major, the Big Bear, the Big Dipper, down to the constellations right along the Milky Way. And this is your introduction into the summer sky, because as we move into that portion of the year, the Milky Way will be getting higher, and we'll be using that as a guide as well to find our way among the main constellations of the summer sky. So I want to say thank you for joining us tonight. It's been a great pleasure having you. Do we have uh, one more question we can do really quickly here? How long has the big spot been on Jupiter? Oh, yes. The question is, how long has the big red spot been on Jupiter? Honestly? We don't know how long the big red spot has been there. Why? Because we've only been, uh, we've only been observing Jupiter with a telescope for a little over 400 years, maybe 410 years or so. So the great red spot was there when Galileo first looked at it. So we have no idea how long it's been there, but we're gonna keep studying it because we notice that it's dynamic. It changes its size, it changes its shape just a little bit, but its size seems to be changing as well as the depth of its color. So we're still trying to better understand what's happening with the dynamics of the clouds on Jupiter. So as I started to say, thank you very much. We've kept you for quite some time here, but I knew there might be another question that we, we, could, uh, we could answer for you. Uh, if there's anything that the COVID-19, do we have time for one more? We do. People would like to know how long did it take for you to feel arrived in the field of science? Well, that's a really interesting question. I know it's late, but I'll see if I can do this. The question is, how long did it take for me to feel as if I had arrived in this particular field of astronomy? How long did it take for me to feel like I'd arrived? Well, it depends what you mean by arrived, but, you know, it took quite a, quite a long time. I've been in this business for quite some time, over 40 years working in the field of astronomy education, and uh, I think it probably took me a good 20 years to feel as if I had arrived. Now, as I say, what does that mean? What does it mean that you have arrived? Well, the way I think of what, I, what it means that I've arrived is that I've come to a point where I've been able to help a tremendous number of people 
connect to and better understand the night sky. And what I appreciate is the level of trust that people have in me as an instructor about the night sky, as an astronomer and instructor about the night sky. That really means a lot to me. I greatly appreciate your support of what I do. And it's taken about that long for me to get to that point. There's a tremendous amount more that I've done in my career, but that's a discussion for another time. We'll talk about that later. But I wanna thank you for supporting the work that I do in astronomy and at the Franklin Institute. It's you that helped, helped me feel as if I've arrived at this point in my career. As I began to say, if there's anything the COVID-19 pandemic has taught us, it is that science matters. And we're seeing that that's tremendously important as we try to figure out just what this virus is, does, and how it's gonna manifest itself as we continue to go forward. But even though the Franklin Institute is closed, we're still finding new ways to continue our ever important mission of sharing science and technology education like this program you're watching now and the other programs that you'll find online at the Franklin Institute's website under the banner, Franklin at Home. We have a tremendous number of videos of various kinds of programs that will give you a little bit of science to help brighten your day and help you understand more about the universe we live in. Please go check out that website so you can see some of the great stuff that we've been doing. If you're able, we would be grateful if you would consider donating to the Franklin Institute today or any other day. We would really, really appreciate your support. You can visit our website, fi.edu, and click on the link uh, in our post to give a gift. We would greatly appreciate that, and we would always thank you for your support. Thanks for joining us tonight. Uh, it takes just a few minutes today to catch up with the night sky. As I've said before, it's your universe. Get out there and explore it. Thanks for the great questions. Next week, we're going to talk about telescopes, everything you need to know to get your telescope in shape for summer viewing sessions, and where to buy telescopes and accessories. Now that Jupiter and Saturn are coming into the evening sky, you'll want to get a good close-up view of them. So if you have a telescope, we can straighten out whatever the problem is with your instrument, hopefully, so that you'll be able to use it to enjoy the night sky this summer. So check us out on franklininstitute.fi.edu, as I said, Franklin at Home programs. And you can follow me on Twitter, at Cool Astronomer for daily updates. Let me remind you again, stay safe, stay cool, and we look forward to seeing you again next week. Again, I'm Derek Pitts, Chief Astronomer at the Franklin Institute, your cool astronomer. Get outside this weekend and enjoy the evening skies. Thanks for joining us, folks. See you next time.